Jay Baba, this is the seventh session in our online God Speaks series uh, entitled um, God Speaks as the Master Framework uh, in Meher Baba's Darshana. This seventh session is going to be on the subject reincarnation, which is the topic of part four, that is to say the fourth chapter. Last week we dealt with the uh, evolution of consciousness. Um, we'll do one session on reincarnation and next week go on to the planes of consciousness. Um, as you can uh, see in this slide, these uh, YouTube, these videos uh, are available on YouTube at, as the, the uh, slide shows you, youtube.com forward slash Maribad. Uh, and uh, on Sunday afternoons, starting at 4 p.m. India time, we have live uh, discussion groups on Google Meet. Uh, and anyone from anyone in the world can take part. Uh, the focus of the discussion is on the uh, video, the YouTube video that appeared most recently before it. And so as you can see, the link is https colon forward slash forward slash meet dot google dot com forward slash b a r hyphen v w d o hyphen y o f um, so you're all cordially invited to uh, take part speak up if you want or just listen in if you prefer that you can also get more information by sending an email to God, all lowercase god speaks reading at gmail dot com <coughs> so this week the focal text is part four reincarnation and the impressionless equipoise consciousness. A nice phrase, isn't it? The impressionless equipoise of consciousness. Um, at the end of uh, uh, the second cha um, chapter, in this footnote that you can see right here, page tw uh, 37, uh, 27, right at the bottom, there's a footnote where uh, Baba has concluded explaining the evolutionary process, the evolution of consciousness and form. Uh, there's a footnote that says this. Meher Baba maintains that sub sub subjects, and he's talking about evolution and the reincarnationary process, such subjects should no longer be left indefinite, although he concedes that belief or non-belief in evolution and reincarnation does not in any way hasten or impede man's spiritual progress. And by evolution, I think what is being referred to is the individual soul's progress through the evolutionary series. He tells us the spiritual significance of evolution and reincarnation in the following words. Quote, this is a quote from Baba. <coughs> It is the evolutionary struggle that enables the soul to develop full consciousness as that in the human form. And the purpose having been achieved, the side issues or byproducts of evolutionary travel, the nukush e amal or sanskaras, those will be the Islamic and um, Indic terms for sanskaras impressions have to be done away with while retaining the consciousness intact. The product of reincarnation, the process of reincarnation, therefore, is to enable the soul to eliminate the sanskaras by passing through the furnace of pain and pleasure. So that's Baba's own comment on the, uh, this whole process. Now, reincarnation in Baba's account occurs within the broader context of the divine theme, which we've been talking about so much and which I'll continue to talk about uh, because it's central to the organization of God Speaks. This slide of Rano Gailey's once again 
uh, illustrates it. Um, you see, f the divine theme is a progress from the beyond state of God on the top, round uh, counterclockwise through evolution to the bottom central part, reincarnation. Uh, that's where we are right now. And after uh, 8,400,000 lifetimes of reincarnation, then you progress through involution of consciousness of the subtle and mental spheres to the realization of God. So the entire divine themes journey has these five steps. Creation originating in the whim of God to know himself. The evolution of consciousness through seven kingdoms reincarnation in human form 84 lakhs of rebirths a lakh is 100,000 so that's 8,400,000 involution through the planes of the subtle and mental spheres and five is uh, the realization of God um, so in uh, as Rano's uh, chart shows again and many charts illustrate this feature Reen in reincarnation, the soul is at its farthest point of remove from God. You can see here is the reincarnationary sequence, and it's at the greatest move from the beyond state of God. The uh, process bottoms out, you could say. At the same time, the whole evolutionary project, the evolution of form and consciousness, which was our subject last time, uh, has resulted in complete, full consciousness. No further consciousness needs to be evolved. You don't get more of it. The problem now is that conscious is what you're conscious of. Uh, with the full consciousness in human form, uh, the jivatma is conscious of its sanskaras rather than conscious of God. Um, also, and this is a significant uh, feature of Meher Baba's account of evolution. With the achievement of human form, the evolution of form ends. There are no further and higher forms. This, on this point, Baba differs from evolutionary science, which presumes we go on evolving and evolving and evolving. No, we don't. The human form is the perfect form and uh, evolution ends there. Now, reincarnation as a stage in the divine theme, the journey of the soul in the divine theme, uh, is just the third out of five stages. And when reincarnation is used, it often is used to refer to that particular phase in the spiritual journey. But the soul is born and dies all the way through before achieving human form and through the involution of consciousness the uh, soul continues to reincarnate but the term reincarnation in the divine theme is r referring to a particular stage in that journey. Um, Baba never really gave a ger general term for the process of dropping a body and taking a no one, new one that would apply to pre-human form. When he says reincarnation, he doesn't use that term with reference to what happens with animals or birds. He didn't really give us a term. Um, their uh, English language, sometimes the word transmigration is used for this, and that would probably be okay. The, also, the uh, term was metempsychosis, which is quite laborious and uh, unpleasant word. I would prefer transmigration as a general term for the soul's moving from one body to another until it achieves human form, at which point reincarnation as such uh, begins. I don't know, in the Indian Indic languages, I suppose we have uh, samsara sometimes is used to refer to the that uh, cloudy oceanic process of birth and death and also janamaran is sometimes used birth death um, but uh, so then when we're talking about reincarnation here we're talking about one particular stage um, now 
the soul before this, the jivatma, uh, was engaged in a continuous, unbroken, uninterrupted stream of progress. Baba used uh, several times. <coughs> Baba used several times the figure of a stick in a stream. If you can imagine a little gully, and there's a stick in it, and the stick continues to progress without interruption, all the way through evolution. It may have been slow, but it was uh, never faltering. But when you reach human form, suddenly you re you've hit the first big impasse. It's like a str the stream has reached an enormous swamp, an enormous bog. The soul is lost, and it wanders and meanders aimlessly for millions of lifetimes. This is the first time in the soul's journey this has happened. Um, the problem is uh, that now there is no need for new sanskaras in order to uh, progress. Throughout the evolution of consciousness, you acquired new sanskaras, and those were the means by which your consciousness developed and matured. Well, in human form, there's no need, more need for consciousness to mature. It's complete. So you're trapped in a process of going between opposites and opposites. That is to say, the sanskaras or impressions that you acquire in one lifetime create the mold and form of your next incarnation, and then you spend them. But in the course of spending them, you create new ones. So then when you die, you've got those new ones, which create a new incarnation, where you spend those and create new ones. It goes on and on and on and on and on, and there seems to be no escape from it. So uh, the irony, if people who are, um, don't believe in any kind of an afterlife uh, would see death as the supreme tragedy, that life ends in death. But if you understand reincarnation properly, the tragedy is that death doesn't work. You can't die. Or you die and you just get born again. You're caught in this endless cycle. Francis Brabazon, Baba's poet, had a very nice line, uh, poetic line for this. I don't know if you know what a merry-go-round is. When your children, you get on this wheel and go round and round on horses or little things. And the line is, the merry-go-round is not so merry when you start to realize that it keeps going round, round and round and round. That's the tragedy of uh, the human predicament. Uh, and here's one last concluding general point I want to make about reincarnation uh, is uh, that in Meher Baba's account, regressive reincarnation doesn't happen. It can't happen. Once you've achieved the human form, you don't go back. You don't get reincarnated as a uh, snake or a cockroach or a rat or anything like that. It seems that the the religious traditions are quite um, ambiguous on this point. They seem many of them seem to say that you can uh, re you can incarnate in a lower form. But Meher Baba's account really explains why that is impossible, which is this: the forms have been evolving in complexity and sophistication and capacity all the way through evolution. And by the time you've got a human consciousness and a human mental subtle body, you need the human gross body. It's the only vehicle that is adequate for the needs of the reincarnating soul. So even if I live a, a really terrible life, let's so suppose I'm a you know, murderer of 100 people, well, I still get reincarnated in human form. It may not be a very pleasant life for me. I may get back what I dished out, but it is as a human being and not as some lower form. So I think that that clarification is very helpful. Okay, um, mostly I'll be, the core of this will be on uh, the chapter in, in God Speaks, but uh, I do want to uh, draw your attention 
to the fact that Baba gave uh, very in-depth treatments of reincarnation in many different ways, and these are really worth looking at. God Speaks is quite narrow in its focus, but the uh, here are some of the um, other places uh, on this slide here. I'll read them and then I'll glance at them for a second. Now, this slide here uh, directs you to some of the most uh, developed treatments of the subject of reincarnation in the Meher Baba's literary oeuvre, to use that word. In uh, the top one here, God Speaks, part four, that's uh, the chapter we're dealing with to get today. And again, in part nine, the chapter of the Ten States of God, pages 179 to 81, state six, God as the human soul in the state of reincarnation. There, that gives you another treatment. Uh, but these last four are very valuable. Discourses has seven essays, reincarnation and karma, parts one through seven. Listen, humanity has a very good uh, chapter, death and immortality, infinite intelligence, um, Series 11, there are 14 series, that's the name for chapters there, and Series 11 is extremely long. It's like Chapter 8 in God Speaks. Um, and uh, that chapter is called The Annihilation of Sanskaras Through the Four Yogas. Uh, the second half of it uh, deals with how you eliminate sanskaras through karma, jnana, and bhakti yoga. But the first half of it is really an explication of how sanskaras keep you embroiled in the reincarnationary process. And the bottom one there, How It All Happened, in a book called Early Messages to the West, um, gives uh, an account. Uh, it's just five pages. It's a film scenario. But what it provides is a uh, storyline of three souls going through five different lifetimes. Uh, and um, that really is f very, very, very clarifying and very interesting. Baba himself gave this storyline, and he wanted a film to be made of it. So uh, in the Reincarnation and Karma series, let me just scroll through these. Uh, the first, this is probably the most extensive and far-reaching and comprehensive treatment of reincarnation that Baba ever gave. He begins by talking about the importance of death um, and then hell and heaven. That's uh, discussed in a somewhat in-depth way. The third chapter, third section is the existence and memory of past lives. You know, there are some people who can remember their past lives. Most of us can't. So Baba explains why that is and what is involved there. Uh, the next is the spe specific conditions of an incarnation. He talks here a lot about sex in evolution and being born in the East versus the West in different cycles of existence. The fifth part the need for male and female in, uh, incarnations. It, he deals with that uh, in a concentrated way, the function that is served by that. The sixth one, the operation of karma through successive lifetimes shows how one lifetime need leads to the next and how the play of karma through different lifetimes is essential to the soul's journey. And the last uh, one, the destiny of the reincarnating individual. Baba talks about how reincarnation culminates in God realization. Okay, I'm just giving you a glimpse of the chapter on death and immortality in uh, Listen Humanity. It's 30, 40 pages long and has a lot of really interesting stuff. For example, it gives the most extended and comprehensive treatment of the issue of suicide that I've ever seen and many other things like that. It's really quite a valuable treatment of the subject. Okay, this uh, book, 
early messages to the West is one that many people don't know about, but this is the critical text for a number of uh, 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 early th uh, publications from the 1930s. And it provides uh, the only uh, published version of the film scenario Baba created. Here you can see in chapter three of how it all happened. The evolution of vegetation, um, then the evolution of animal forms. Uh, here Baba had these sketches made of exotic creatures that used to exist on the earth. Um, but the most, par the portion really relevant to reincarnation is here. I'm just showing you in brief what it looks like. It's very, very sketchy, but first lifetime, three cannibals. Cannibals are eating a corpse around a fire in the jungle. One man, X, catches the eye of a young woman, Y. They smile at one another and he throws her a tasty bit of human flesh. I guess if you're a cannibal, that's how you court a woman. You don't give her roses, you throw her a, a nice human shoulder. She eats. Another man, Z, is jealous and a fight ensues between the two men. X wins and kills Y. That's the first of the five lifetimes. And he goes through five lifetimes, by the last of which one of them has become a perfect master. Uh, you see the swing between opposites, uh, between one lifetime and another. So it's a very, it, it concretizes a lot of these principles that are enunciated in the abstract in these other uh, uh, writings. Okay, little break and I'll... That's, I think, the last of these switches I'll need to do. Although at the end I may be coming back to it. Okay. Um, are we on again? Okay. Okay. So now coming to chapter four itself. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned in a previous se uh, session um, a pattern in God Speaks. At least I notice it. Um, Baba repeats many times that the form into which you are born is the consolidated mold of the sanskaras or impressions you acquired in your last lifetime. So in a way, we're always living out our last lifetime, what we created then. We're always living out the past. Um, this theme in an abstract, deep, very difficult, but very profound way comes up in chapter eight, about pages 89 to 92, 93, if you have the most recent edition of the book. But something that I've noticed about the uh, rhetorical narrative strategy of God Speaks. Um, God's, the divine theme is a narrative, right? It's a storyline. And I notice that Baba often will introduce a topic, let's say a certain moment in the course of his story, but then he'll develop by going back into its history, where it came from. It's like he keeps s cycling back and forth, back to the prior and coming, returning to the point uh, in the story where he is right now. Um, uh, it's almost like a spiral movement of progress. I haven't seen that in other books of Meher Baba's. So far as I can see, it's distinctive to God Speaks. Well, we get two really good examples of that right here in uh, part four. As you can see from the very beginning, during the course of evolution of its consciousness, the soul, Atma, while consciously identifying itself with varied, finite, gross forms. You see, he's gone back to evolution. He's starting reincarnation by saying where it came to from. But now he's got a particular focus that he didn't develop in those earlier chapters, which you can see here. Was also simultaneously, though unconsciously, identifying itself with its 
finite subtle form and its finite mental form. Now, you may recall in the first part, in the first chapter, Baba laid out the whole structure. There are three bodies, gross, subtle, mental. There are three spheres, gross, subtle, mental. He spent a lot of time on that. Um, when he talked about evolution in parts two and three, he talked about the evolution of form, but he never mentioned the subtle and mental bodies. But they were part of the picture, and now he's going to bring them back into the story, which he does right here. Um, finite mental form, which associated with the soul, now get this phrase, in compact, homogeneous, unconscious alliance. So the gross, subtle, and mental bodies. The subtle and mental bodies are very primitive and very minimal, but it's like they're all squenched up together. They're all so compressed that you can't even really differentiate them very clearly at all, but they're there. They're there from the very start. Uh, unconscious alliance throughout the entire course of evolution of consciousness, right from the first urge, okay? Do you get that? Now there's uh, a chart later in God Speaks that shows this, but I'm going to show the earlier version of that same chart because I think it's it's better actually. This was drawn by Baba's disciple Rano Gailey and was part of a booklet called The Divine Theme published in 1943. It's available. I really recommend you get it. And it has these charts. And what uh, but this will be chart 10 in God Speaks, in your books of God Speaks, if you have the second edition. I think it's there in the first edition, too. And what this is showing um, is the divine theme from the perspective of the evolution of the structure of the false self. Here is the false self, where my laser is pointing, in stone. And you see it's becoming more and more complex until in human form, there it is fully developed. Now there is some further transformation. This part here on the right is the involutionary process. And there is some further development, but it's all much more subtle. The number of rings, or they're called koshas is the term for it, remains unchanged. Um, let me here to illustrate in stone form you've got a soul at the center slightest consciousness and a gross body the rest is so compressed and compacted it might as well not even be there okay jumping up to fish you have a gross body on the outside a little developed subtle body is the next ring you have, a more, you have more developed instinct. Instinct has come into the picture. And consciousness, a little more consciousness. By the time you get up to animals here, again, soul is in the center. The next is partial consciousness. The next ring, these are called koshas, is the term for it in Indian metaphysics, psychology. Fully developed instinct, partially developed intellect and then a still more developed subtle body. Baba doesn't men mention anything like a mental body, not because it isn't there, but because it hasn't really been articulated yet. Uh, it's Everything is like an, an accordion. It's been so compressed that the folds of the, uh, when you open it, or a harmonium, let's say, the folds of it start to appear gradually one at a time. Now in the human form, you get all of them. And we could spend an entire weekend just on this one chart. In fact, I have done so. But you can see there's a subtle body, a mental body, and so forth. So this is what has been happening through the course of evolution. The false self has been... Uh, evolving, developing, uh, becoming more articulate, more complex uh, all the way through. Baba also mentions here, just one second, I'm just getting where I am here. Okay. 
So at the bottom of this first page of the chapter, uh, the jivatma, the soul, arrives at the human form. And here, the uh, soul is fully equipped with a human body, subtle body, and mental body, together with full consciousness of the gross. The subtle body and mental body are fully developed. But the gross conscious hum man or woman is not conscious of the subtle body or the mental body, even though they're there. Now, as Baba says here, up here in the next chapter, in the first paragraph, the, uh, the uh, soul c can draw upon it and use it for gross purposes. Like I can draw on the energy of my subtle body to raise my hand or run the 100-yard dash or punch someone in the nose or whatever, eat some dinner, whatever it may be. I use subtle energy, but I'm not directly conscious of energy there. And in the same way, uh, the gross conscious soul can, and I'm reading here from this uh, first paragraph, it can use mind through various gross aspects of mind, such as desires, emotions, and thoughts. Of these, desires are the predominant aspect of mind. So I would keep those three aspects of mind in mind. Desires, feelings, and thoughts are the three aspects of mind. And he's going to return to those a number of times. Th thoughts belong to the fifth plane. Feelings belong to the sixth plane. And desires, Baba says later, are the highest aspect of mind. And you might ask, why would that be? And to give a very quick answer, what desires are, in my understanding anyway, is the whim of God, misdirected towards false objects. I desire, uh, you know, a chapati. I desire a drink of water, those things. What I really want is God, but because of my sanskaras, I'm misidentifying what it is that I want. So desires are the highest aspect of mind. Also, Baba did say at the end of his, on the previous page, this paragraph here, gradually he's taught how instinct has developed by, you know, worm at the beginning, bird, fish are starting to have it. This um, instinct, instinct is further and completely transformed into intellect. This being the highest finite aspect of manifestation of the mental form in the human form of the gross conscious human soul experiencing the gross world. It, gross conscious people are centered in their intellects. And this is just a mention that Baba gives of a topic that he has treated more fully elsewhere. Uh, in this uh, slide from a book that will be coming out soon, Creation and Its Causes, I've mentioned this a number of times, uh, you can see the fuller series. Here, fish has finite instinct, bird less finite instinct, animal has instinct, human has intellect. But now when you start to go on the involutionary journey uh, through the planes of consciousness, intellect finds higher modes. Thus, on the first plane, it becomes inspiration. On the second plane, revelation. On the third plane, insight. On the fourth plane, intuition. On the fifth plane, illumination and ecstasy. On the sixth plane, divine sight. And on the seventh plane, realization. Within Baba's fold, there has been a lot of interest on the cultivation of intuition, uh, which you can see here. Intuition reaches its full development on the fourth plane of consciousness. The term which Baba gave to this aspect of consciousness, the evolution from instinct to intellect, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is Chaitanya. That's a major word in Hindu uh, thought, and it means many different things there. But the particular application which Baba gave to it is this, a change not just in consciousness, but you might say in the modality 
of consciousness. So God Speaks doesn't go into this topic to the extent that I've just shown you, but he gives a hint of it in what we were just uh, looking at a minute ago. In um, Okay, one little second as I get back. Let me get rid of this. Okay, so in this paragraph here, you can see Baba is completing the movement from the last animal form to the first human incarnation. And he says, when all the impressions of the last most animal gross form are exhausted, it is but natural that the first most human gross form is dissociated from the soul. This experience of the soul is universally termed the death of the, f of the human being. So the first human incarnation is actually a manifestation of the sanskaras of the last animal form. And when those sanskaras are exhausted, you die. And then you acquire a new one, a new form, a new human form, which is nothing other than the mold of the sanskaras that you acquired during your first human lifetime. This process uh, keeps repeating. And he says this here. It was also previously explained that though the soul is dissociated from its first most human gross form, the soul retains and experiences through the subtle and mental bodies the impressions of the dropped or dissociated first most human form. So when you die, and this is happening in evolution too, you retain all the impressions your, in your consciousness even though you don't have a body. And these, these impressions have to get spent. And that drives you to associate with the new form. That happened in evolution and it is still happening now. So the association of the soul with the next most human form is universally, uh, is called universally the birth of a human being. And uh, now Baba comes to the topic of what happens between incarnations. In evolution, all he said was that the consciousness is still centered on its impressions. He didn't say anything more than that. But in human form, there is more. The apparent gap, as the uh, bottom paragraph on this page reads, between the death and birth of a human being is that period in which the gross conscious soul in its association with its fully developed subtle and mental bodies has experience of the predominant counterpart of the opposite impressions gathered by the recently dissociated human form. Now what does he mean? Y when you have all kinds of opposite impressions in the course of your lifetime that you spend and then you get. But s whatever is predominant is what you predominantly experience uh, between, b uh, between death and birth. So if for the most part, to use the moral dichotomy of good and evil, your impressions have been evil, you'll experience those in the health state. And if predominantly your actions were good, you will experience heaven. Uh, in the term between birth and death. Uh, this topic is, of course, much um, celebrated or of much interest in the various religions. So these are just some images I collected. Here are some Christian images of hell. But it's not just Christianity. Buddhism, you can sort of pick which kind of hell you'd like most, to those of you who are destined to go to hell like me, as I was told by Pindu. Uh, you hear people are being boiled in a pot with devils around them. Uh, here's a spectacular imagery from a temple in Thailand. Here in the Hindus, you see in Hinduism and Buddhism, hell and heaven have a place in their account. After death, you go through a term of heaven and hell uh, before being reincarnated. In the Christian and Islamic uh, conceptions, these are eternal, they last forever. But Baba's account uh, 
is shares with the Hindu and Buddhist um, versions that the, uh, the heaven and terms in heaven and hell states are of finite duration and that is because they are purposeful you see the soul is trying to balance all the opposites because the whim of God is unconsciously or semi-consciously pushing towards the goal of realization and to do that all these sanskaras have to be balanced and gotten rid of what heaven and hell does is after death the soul is trying to get rid of the overload on one side of the scale if i have a tremendous excess of really really good sanskaras well I, i'm out of balance i can be bound by good also so what happens i have a blissful experience in heaven in paradise Nark and Swarg are some of the names used for this in Hinduism. Um, what are the, uh, the Islamic Dozak and um, Behisht in Islam? So all the, many of the religions uh, have a grasp of this idea. But the purpose is to get rid of your imbalance. And just when you're getting to the point, this chapter explains this very beautifully, just when you've reached the point where the the stacks the the two are in balance again because you've burnt off the excess what happens is that you jump into a new body you invariably go ahead and reincarnate if you could simply get that balance achieved you would be liberated but that never happens and the reason for it is this that uh, you, g this is my language for it. Baba puts it another way. There's a momentum. You get so involved and engrossed in the experiencing of the opposite. Like, let's suppose I've been really terrible in my lifetime. I've embezzled and swindled people and done things like that. Well, I'm reviewing my memories of that lifetime in sort of a hell state. It's very full of suffering because I'm conscious of how bad I'm in. But I'm so absorbed in it that I don't stop and I don't detach myself at the moment of balance. So I swing over to the other side, to the good side. And my next lifetime, I'm very likely to acquire all kinds of goods and scaras because I'm going from opposite to opposite. So you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on and on the heaven and hell states have a purpose you burn off excess and scaras uh, but in Baba's discourses he says these further things about it that uh, it gives you time I think Baba says for a leisurely survey of your sanskaras sort of a very pleasant way of putting it but you know when you're in the body you're constantly having to do things you have to act you have to you know I have an appointment at this time I have to do this I have to, you're always adjusting to things that are coming at you and you don't have the leisure to really reflect on the sense scares that are there well after death you don't have a body and you're not caught up in the swirl of things so Life in the body, Baba gives this very interesting um, point, uh, uh, insight. In the body, it's objective and forward-looking. You look into the future. If you're driving down a highway, why do you always look ahead? <laughs> if you don't, you'll crash. That's kind of a metaphor for what life in the body is like. We're constantly uh, um, looking forward to navigate our way through it in the uh, state between death and birth in heaven and hell there's no body you're in you're not interacting with others it is retrospective you're looking back in time the and the experience is much more subjective uh, because you get I have to be objective if I'm talking to somebody I have to be, be responsive to that person, that object in my life, 
to one extent or another. But in uh, heaven or hell state, I'm not interacting with anybody, so I can be completely subjective and introspective and self-absorbed. It gives an occasion for this. And now this is just one question I would like to ask because I've never fully answered it in my own mind. Um, let's suppose I've lived a terrible life and I've killed people and done all sorts of terrible bad actions and I suffer in the hell state, okay? The law of karma has it that in my next lifetime a lot of what I have done will come back on my own head and I'll have done to me what I did to others. So this is the question I have. Isn't that double jeopardy? Aren't I being punished twice for the same thing? I mean, I suffered in hell, and now I'm suffering in my future incarnation. Similarly, let's suppose I did a, had a wonderful life. I served others. I was philanthropic. I attended to the poor and the sick. And after death, I have the heaven state, and I have bliss. In my next lifetime, I'm born into a wealthy family, and good things happen to me, and people come to my aid whenever I need it. Aren't I getting rewarded twice for the uh, same good good life that I led. Um, I'd, I thought a lot about this, and I have ways of responding to it myself, but I flip that out there uh, for what any of you may happen to think about this. In the middle of this chapter, uh, Baba reverts to a review um, of, uh, oh, let me just uh, say right at the top of this page, um, this state of the soul in the apparent gap between death and birth is generally called hell or heaven. This process of intermittent association and dissociation of consciousness of the conscious soul in human form, now fully conscious, is termed the reincarnation process. Here, Baba gives us a formal definition of what he's talking about. And this is a stage in the divine theme. And here's where he talks about the, uh, what c the link between um, vice and virtue on the one hand and heaven and hell on the other. That's a point which I'd like to go into some more so at some point. If the predominant counterpart of the impressions of opposites, okay, it's like the predominant opposite, whatever it was, uh, such as vice or virtue, good and evil, male and female, etc., as experienced by the soul, now associated only with the subtle and mental. Th that is, why is that? Because you don't have a body. The gross is not there. If the predominant counterpart is of virtue or goodness, i.e., the positive aspect of the opposite impressions, then the soul is said to be in heaven. If it is a vice or evil, i.e., the negative aspect of opposite impressions, then the soul is said to be in hell. Heaven and hell are not places, they are states, states of consciousness. In this book, Creation and Its Causes, that's going to be published soon, uh, Baba does specify that these are located on the second plane of consciousness. Uh, that's where souls go, although they're not conscious of the second plane as such. Okay, now right here at the bottom of the page, I won't go over this closely, but I just wanted to point out it is in this manner that an unending chain of births and deaths um, continues to form and dwindle. What an interesting word. They form and dwindle. Um, now, then he goes back to the very beginning. Throughout the whole process of evolution, okay, in fact, here's the purpose. Until it has gained full gross consciousness comparable to the wide open state of uh, man in the awake state while exper experiencing, okay, I'm going to go back and do this over from this point. Um, here, Baba starts to describe um, reincarnation, the, the journey. He's going to retell the whole spiritual journey. He's doing another big loop back. But now, with reference to what's going to be a very important uh, trinity, triad, sound sleep, dream, 
and wakefulness. This is going to be a huge topic. It's going to come up in a big way in chapter 8. This is the first anticipation. Uh, this is the course of reincarnation in human form of the soul after it has gained full gross con consciousness through the whole series of evolution of the gross consciousness. Evolution was an evolution of great conscious, uh, gross consciousness. Right from the unconscious state of the soul, comparable to the deep sleep state of man, until it has ta attained full gross consciousness, comparable to the wide awake, uh, uh, wide open eyes of the man in the awake state, while experiencing the gross world, the soul is one, indivisible, infinite, formless, and is eternally in the oversoul. Remember those, that kind of lingo? We had that in the very first chapter. Baba is reminding us through all of this, the soul is one. It never departs from that and is never in anything like that. However, it did go from sound sleep he, he doesn't mention the word here, through dream of evolution to wide awake state in human form. Okay, and now throughout this whole page, Baba retraces the whole course of the evolution of consciousness. This is another instance, as I say, of Baba looping back. He's got to human form and now he's looping back through the entire story of the journey of the soul that led until this point. Now at the bottom of the page, as you can see here, in human form, the soul achieves full and complete consciousness. Therefore, the soul, having now gained full and complete consciousness in human form, does not need any more or any other higher forms to evolve consciousness. Okay, let me just take a second to... Uh, I'll remind myself of where I am in the notes here. How much time do you think has been? Uh, oh, so I better wrap it up pretty quickly. Okay. I'll be much more abbreviated then. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, towards the second half of this uh, chapter, Baba starts to explore more deeply the topic of balance and a perfect balance. Uh, when a complete balance of experiences of opposite oppressions is just about to be attained, it is just then disturbed by the consciousness of the soul associating itself with the new human form, right? Just when balance is about to be achieved, you reincarnate. Absence of this association would otherwise have neutralized the effect of the impressions by an equal balance of respective opposite experiences and would thus have liberated the consciousness of the soul from all impressions of opposites. Just when it's about to reach the point where it could be liberated, it reincarnates. And just when you've spent your life, your impressions through the course of a lifetime, you die. So you, you never can reach the proper balance. And here, Baba brings up on these two paragraphs um, the metaphor uh, of a balance. The consciousness gained by the soul during the process of evolution resembles the indicator at the fulcrum of a perfect balance. And the two pans of the balance are filled with unequal weights of opposites of impression, such as virtue and vice, etc. Now, in many parts of the world, people will never have seen this. But here in uh, Village Erangown, when you go buy your vegetables, they still have scales like this. You'll have on one side a weight and another your vegetables and they have to achieve a balance. And there's a fulcrum and there's like an indicator saying are you more one way or more another way. Baba's using this metaphor. So if you have too much of one side, you have too much vice, well in the hell state you burn it up through suffering and just 
when you're reaching a point of balance, you swing the other way. And then you've got too much good and you have a heaven state after that lifetime. And just when you're reaching balance, you swing the other way. So um, when he talks about equipoise, that's what never gets achieved. Um, and what happens, okay, it is at the, in the next page, it is at this juncture that the consciousness of the soul turns towards the experience of the newly predominant opposite impressions through another human form. Now, you, I was all bad last lifetime, but now the good is becoming ascendant, and so I swing and I start to experience those impressions instead. I never stop. I never stop this pendulum from swing, uh, swinging back and forth. And Baba says, it seems unending. It seems like we're never going to get out of it. It seems impossible to break the chain. But Baba does say that over the course of m your many, many lifetimes in human form, uh, he one place characterizes it as a shaking. Your impressions get shaken. And here he says they get more and more and more concentrated. Um, and now you have highly concentrated impressions that you need to get rid of. Um, and, uh, okay, I'm going to... Just one second as I find the very place that I need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here he says, uh, talks about this. At every stage, in every state of reincarnation, the consciousness of the fully human conscious soul gets firmly centralized in the more and more concentrated impressions of the human forms. Okay, these impressions have to be exhausted. And now look at this paragraph, the last on the page. The only solution is to thin out this concentration of impressions. Uh, the only solution to do this is for the consciousness of the fully human conscious soul to experience, now get this, increasingly and more rapidly these impressions at such a w uh, in such a way and at so great a frequency that every impression experienced and the impression that this experience created should be counterbalanced somehow by an opposite impression. So a process of very quick movement where every new impression immediately gets counterbalanced. I think this is why you need a master. It's the master that enables... Um, this to happen. Finally, um, it is this cycle of deaths and consequent births of human form that ultimately results in inciting the fully evolved consciousness of the gross conscious human soul to involve. Finally, when the sanskaras are sufficiently thinned out, you start to turn inwards and to go on the involutionary journey um, and uh, that will be the subject of the next chapter this process of involution sorry I can't expand this properly but the, uh, gradually takes place as the gross impressions of the opposites gradually become fainter and less concentrated um, finally the gross impressions are eliminated altogether and uh, you become conscious of your subtle impressions and enter into the involutionary path. So that's the treatment of reincarnation that Baba gives in God Speaks. He's really trying to explain how the uh, compiled and aggregated sanskaras um, go through this process of mutual adjustment and balancing to the point where you can start to become free of them. Um, the evolutionary journey was simply one of, of expanding your horizons, your sanskaric horizons, covering all fronts, having all experiences. As a deer, I have the experience of eating vegetation, and as a tiger, I have the experience of eating deer. You have to have everything. You have to have uh, all bases have to be covered. But in human form, the problem is completely different. Now you've got this huge mass of sanskaras. 
How do you ever get free from them? And Baba is starting to explain the fundamental processes that are at work through the course of reincarnation in human form that ultimately culminate in your entering into the involutionary path and the next stage of the divine team. That will be our topic next time. I think I'll uh, look just at uh, part six, parts, um, uh, part five, I'm sorry, just at part five. Parts five, six, and seven in God Speaks all deal with involution, although from different angles of vision. Part five is a kind of a basic exposition of the seven planes of consciousness, and that will be our topic next time. Okay, I look forward to, uh, I wish I could see you then, but look forward to seeing you then imaginatively. And with that, a uh, big Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai.